Thank you, and thank you for having me. And um, it's just Steve, unless you're donating a couple of million dollars, then it's probably more formal. Um, and I would say with this size of a group, let's um, ask questions while I'm talking, because then we've got the slides on the screen. And um, so, can I walk around? Can I stand over here with that? Right here, we can do this. Will that pick up enough for you? Testing, one, two, three, is that a yay or an A back there? Yeah, we can get you a handheld. Hang on. Right there, handheld. Yeah, I don't want to do the handheld. <laughs> I'm flying my arms around too much. We'll hit the screen or something. Um, oh, you want down here? Okay. So until then, we'll do. Go. <laughs> so I actually. Um, Tell us about this so, little graphic here. So this is a double-stranded RNA, and I had this on my screen for about two months, just constantly rolling in the background because we had a problem that I'll talk about some of the chemistry. And um, instead of having it green and orange are the phosphates, and green are all the other atoms on the RNA that I had all the colors of carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, and it was very confusing because your eye immediately focuses on base pairs. Because as a molecular biologist, you're focused on double-stranded RNA, double-stranded DNA. And you couldn't see the forest through the trees was the problem. And then one day it occurred to me that um, if I just got rid of all of that by filling in and using the space filling with all the hydrogens, turn everything green except for the phosphates, because we're doing phosphate chemistry, that that would become clear. As soon as I did that, after counting this for two months rolling on my screen, it was just bam, immediately obvious what the problem was. So here's all the financial disclosure. So everything I say, take with a grain of salt if it has any commercial value, because um, I'm obviously biased and influenced. There, how's that? A little bit better? A little less background? Okay, um, so in the primordial world, it's RNA. So this whole dogma of DNA to RNA to proteins is actually wrong. So the world didn't start as DNA, it started as RNA. And then there was the invention of the lipid bilayer. And this little lipid was hydrophobic in the middle and charged on both sides. What? <laughs> I don't think they had any IP back then. So three and a half billion years ago, this gets invented and it's essentially a soap bubble. And what happens is it compartmentalizes these macromolecules, the RNAs that are heavily charged, negatively charged, and the ones that are on the outside are prevented from getting to the ones on the inside. And the ones on the inside now are trapped in there and they can do perform chemical reactions on substrates to convert them into products that stay confined inside here. So you can have concentration gradients that are different between here and on the outside. I think I'm getting too close to that. So um, this essentially allows life to happen, depending on your religion. And um, so once this gets so big, bubbles, just like when a kid blows a bubble, if it gets too big, it'll spontaneously split into two bubbles. And that's exactly what happens. So you, we don't have the typical cytokinesis. It just gets larger and larger until it splits into two. And now we have two daughter cells. And we essentially have Eve and the origin of life. Because RNA is catalytic, um, whereas DNA is not. So after the invention of the lipid bilayer then, and, and the invention of DNA, so RNA invents DNA as a more stable form of holding the genetic information. And then RNA invents proteins as a way to make RNAs more catalytically active by keeping it in a confined structure. And then, of course, proteins are much more diverse with 20 repeating units. And so they take on a whole world of their own. So the invention of RNA interference, so or RNAi. And this is a way that small, double-stranded microRNAs can regulate mRNA expression after it's been transported out of the nucleus. So if there's a shock, if there's um, starvation, if there's an injury, you could prevent an mRNA from being translated into a protein very rapidly. Whereas if RNAi didn't exist, once it was trans an mRNA was transcribed in the nucleus and it was transported to the cytoplasm, it would be immediately translated into a protein. You wouldn't have a way to stop that until that protein eventually was degraded. So RNAi serves 
an incredibly important aspect um, from uh, algae and fungi, fungi all the way up to humans up the food chain. So, and what this allowed us to do as um, biochemical scientists is that this now becomes a potential therapeutic. And it's an amazing therapeutic. It has unbelievable properties that I'll go through right now. So the effective concentration is one picomolar. There are few, if any, small molecule inhibitors that have a one picomolar IC50, for instance. Um, EC50 because of the mechanism of action. Um, it's catalytic, which is why the EC50 is so low, and you can target each and every mRNA. And so what that allows you to do, since I'm a cancer biologist, is you can drug the undruggable, which is right now probably 92% of the entire genome is undruggable with small molecules or with antibodies, just completely inaccessible. There's not a, a cleft or a, a hole in order to put a small molecule into, or they're not expressed on the surface. And what this allows you to do is to target KRAS, MYC, oncogenic transcription factors that are completely untouchable today, even though there's been, there's been a tremendous amount of um, research trying to target, these are two critical oncogenes that drive a majority of malignancies. So what that means is there's 560 odd oncogenes that drive cancer and each and every single one of those, regardless of their function, is a target of RNA interference. And there's no way a small molecules are ever going to be able to go after all of these and you can hit multiple ones simultaneously, up to 10 simultaneously, which allows you to, to generate a synthetic lethal where the normal cells can do without these genes, but the cancer cells are absolutely required due to the mutations and overexpression of these oncogenes. And there's just not a therapeutic approach on the table today that would allow you to do that, to set up these kind of synthetic lethals regardless of what the gene was. And then the, the, perhaps the most important point is that you can pharmaco-evolve the drug to generate a truly precision medicine therapeutic that goes after each patient's oncogenes that have individual mutations that are specific to that cancer and specific to that patient. All lung cancer patients do not have the exact same mutated DNA profile that activates oncogenes. And so you can't make a universal drug that goes after lung cancer or prostate cancer or breast cancer. Every patient, unfortunately, is like an individual disease under a category of a given type of malignancy. But with these RNA drugs, you sequence those um, mutant oncogenes and you design an RNA that goes selectively after that. And so what that effectively allows you to do, is we're looking at the amount of tumor burden over time in years, is that a patient gets to a point where their tumor is diagnosable, you biopsy it, you DNA sequence it, which today occurs essentially overnight. It's $1,000 to do an entire genome today, so it's really inexpensive. And then you design your RNA medicine number one. And this now will kill that cancer cell based on the genetics of the cancer cell and it won't touch any normal cells that um, don't express these genetic mutations. Now, what about, uh, do you get a mutation? I mean, uh, so you just one hit, and then or you don't have to have like three different... So probably you have to generate a synthetic allele. So we haven't gone here. Oh. We haven't gotten there that far. But the idea is that you would hit two, three, perhaps five different oncogenes. Um, and that, that way, if you hit five at a time in one drug, one vial drug, that, that way, if a patient only had two or three or four of those mutations, you could still give them that drug because if they don't have the mutation, the, the other two or three are completely inert. They're completely inactive. And that's kind of the beauty of the approach. Is if you, whereas if you take a drug today and you don't have the genetic mutation, you're going to have toxicity associated with that drug. And when you, when you put that in vial of that with a second or third or a fourth drug, the summation of all of those toxicities becomes problematic. So you don't have off-target. Exactly. So you can select to avoid any off-target effects with this because the target is the RNA, and so you can do RNA sequencing to know exactly if you're hitting the target you're going after, MYC for instance, and you're not hitting anything else, or if you're hitting two, three, or 50 other genes. And if you're hitting 50 other genes, you wouldn't ever move that forward as a potential drug candidate. 
Now, is it a one-time treatment, or do you have to have multiple? So for cancer, we're probably going to be dosing this on once a week for six, six weeks to 12 weeks, and then stop, see what happens, and then come back and, and uh, redose the patient. So after that initial dosing, then the patient goes into remission below the level of detection. And of course, you get recurrent disease, and this is essentially what kills cancer patients today. It's not the primary tumor you die from, with the exception of a few malignancies. It's the recurrent disease, because now the recurrent disease is, by definition, resistant to the first therapy. So, and the same is true of RNA therapies. You come back now and you hit it with the exact same sequence and genes that you were targeting the first time, and they're completely resistant because you put the tumor cell under pressure to acquire new oncogene mutations or even to mutate where these RNAs specifically bind. But in this kind of a pharmaco-evolvable drug, you biopsy, sequence and you design new RNAs to new oncogene mutations or where the existing drug bound to the um, uh, mRNA, if there's a point mutation there, you just change a C to a G or an A to a U. Um, it's trivial to do these things. You could give me a random 21 nucleotide sequence right now and in seven days I could have hand you a completely purified RNA. So which you could inject into a patient, assuming the FDA allowed you to do that in some distant future. So that it's trivial to change the sequence for these drugs. But the biochemical properties of these drugs are identical. So changing the sequence does very little to actually change the biophysical properties and the toxicity profiles. So once you know the tox profile due to the backbone, the RNA structure, and any modifications you have there, the sequence, changing the sequence is trivial because the sequence doesn't actually, it's buried in this green gamish here. So unlike DNA, which is a, a much more open alpha helix, it's a beta form, that RNA is compacted into an A form helix. And so the nucleobases aren't exposed to solution, like to solvent, like they are in DNA. So there's, very, there's no double-stranded RNA-specific binding proteins because the bases are just not accessible uh, chemically in order for a protein or amino acid to get a handle on that. With so, precision, you have to do a precision three? Yeah, so I think the, the idea is, so in the same way of HIV, so for AIDS, there is no cure for AIDS today. Every patient that's infected with HIV has HIV and we're managing the disease with a cocktail of inhibitors that occasionally changes as that virus load is constantly turning over um, and new mutations are acquired. So it's the same idea here. So the idea of a cure is, is you can't really discuss that at this point in time, but you can discuss, especially for a new modality like this, the idea of managing the patient's disease. So if you can get this down into a steady state level that's below the level of detection, and then one, two, three, five years later, you're of course monitoring these patients two, three, four times a year to look out for this. So you catch it when it's much smaller than when it was initially diagnosed in all likelihood, and then change the sequences and go back in and hit it again. So wait two, three, five years, do the exact same thing. So I think the, the parallels of managing cancer and the way that we manage HIV you can have a, a small tumor load if it's not dividing and it's not intruding on critical functions. It's when the tumor load gets so big and metastasizes that it imposes itself on all these other bodily functions and then the body just shuts down and, and the patient succumbs to the disease. When you talk about a biopsy in that context of the recurrent disease, what forms of biopsy do you anticipate? So, this is sort of the, this is dramatically evolving because of the release of genetic information into blood. You can actually find out for a lot of malignancies, and this is a works in progress, um, you can diagnose them from a blood sample, the DNA that's released from the tumor cells. And so you can do it through a blood biopsy, liquid biopsy, which is evolving. Um, and if you know where the METs are because of scans, CT scans, um, MRIs, that you can go under PET scans, you can go in and biopsy that with a small amount of material, you can get a complete DNA sequence. So it, it doesn't take much um, biopsy material to sequence the DNA and find out why this therapy has, this therapy, the first one has now failed. And it could be that the initial gene you were targeting, the MYC transcription factor, is now downregulated or mutated where that specific um, sRNA binds to 
that it's been mutated, if, it's mute, if the sequence is mutated in the gene, then this won't work in the same way that a small molecule drug won't work once a, a kinase has been inactive, the active site's been inactive by a single point mutation. So unlike the ability of small molecules to a, an active site, you're stuck with this molecule. It's a static molecule. So it can bind as long as it's a wild type binding site or whatever type of a, of a gene it was targeted. But once you get a mutation that prevents that from being loaded into the active site, this drug is completely inactive. And you can't go back and add to it a couple of carbonyls or a nitrogen or X, Y, or Z. That's an entirely new drug that you've got to go back to square one. And from the FDA's point of view, where they're very concerned about toxicity, this has an entirely different tox profile than the parental drug does, depending. You've got to figure all that out. So you've got to go back to a phase one. The expectation with RNA drugs is that because the um, solvent exposed part of this is constant. And as I said earlier, the actual bases, which are the selective agent to go after specific genes, are not solvent exposed for the most part, that once the backbone after 20 drugs are approved shows that it doesn't have a tox profile or that you expect this, this, and this, then it's just a matter of going to the potential off-target effects, which you can figure out very easily in non-human primates. Um, through RNA sequencing and show that, in fact, okay, it doesn't hit any inappropriate genes. It only hits the target gene. Um, let's do a larger phase two and then argue for approval just like you would do for an orphan drug, for instance. Can you um, inject the uh, naked or just No, so that's the whole problem. If it was that, this is like a gift from God in terms of treating cancer because of all of these properties. Um, and so we can go after cancer and pandemic influenza and chronic genetic diseases. Um, you name a disease except for parasitic and uh, bacterial infections. So all viral infections and any diseases that are caused by humans' uh, genetic profile alone, this in theory can treat. And it's just this dirty little problem. And that is that this is a terrible drug. And I'll walk through why this is a terrible drug, but basically it's too charged and it's too large to be delivered. And your body, going back evolutionarily from the, the prototypical original cell to metazoans like us, so we've been fighting naked, invading nucleic acids for three and a half billion years, trying to keep them on the outside of our body, on the outside of our cells once they enter our bodies. And so there's an incredible level of defenses that you have to get by in order to deliver this drug into the cells. And I'll walk right through that. So um, the first problem is that they're too charged. So this has the backbone of a typical sRNA drug, which is 21 nucleotides that's double-stranded. And that's what this is here. The phosphates are in orange here. There's 40 phosphates on a typical siRNA. And so it has absolutely no bioavailability against this billion-year-old barrier. In contrast, a small molecule like AZT that's under 500 Daltons, which is typically what most small molecules are, um, in order to passively diffuse across the membrane, that, that can easily go and reach a the same concentration on the inside that's on the outside. Um, the problem is AZT is an inactive drug, and it needs to be phosphorylated. It's an anti-HIV drug, um, and it needs to be phosphorylated on the inside of the cells. And that's the rate limiting step. AZT is not a great drug because it doesn't go in with a single phosphate called the alpha phosphate. So if you put that alpha phosphate on AZT, it's still under 500 Daltons. And a Dalton is a, a molecular weight. It's essentially the equivalent of a hydrogen. Um, and it's, allow, it's just like weighing yourself by pounds. It allows us to compare um, one molecule to another. So if you put a phosphate on there, a single phosphate, which is negatively charged, it has absolutely no bioavailability. Even though it's under 500 Daltons, that one charge prevents it from crossing this lipid bilayer, which was set up originally to keep charged nucleic acids on the outside. So any highly charged small molecules, it effectively keeps them out on the outside as well too, which is a great way to protect cells from any potential toxins that come in. So a single phosphate on a small molecule that would work Otherwise, we have 40 of these. So this is a huge problem in comparison. 
The second problem is we have a defense of secreting enzymes called RNases, and RNases chew up RNAs like there's no tomorrow. In fact, your fingertips right now, if you go like this, you're feeling RNAses. So they're in the, the moisture in your fingertips. They're everywhere, on your counters at home, every place you put your hands, there's RNAses on all your dishes everywhere. And so when we work in the laboratory, we have to have gloves on that we change each time because otherwise the RNAs on your fingertips, when I was a graduate student, we didn't quite appreciate this, that it'll eat up your RNA and degrade this like no tomorrow because this is viewed as invading nucleic acids, genetic material. So your body's trying to prevent it you know, through this three billion years of evolution. So this is a big problem, stability from RNAs, which are in your blood, on your skin, between cells, inside of cells. The third problem is your kidneys. Mm -hmm. So kidneys filter out things that look like salts. So your blood needs to be at just the right pH and just the right uh, osmolality, the right concentration of salt. And if it gets off from, like, from that, you can pass out one way or the other and lead to uh, other chronic problems. So if you inject this into a mouse, and you look five minutes later, it's all in the bladder. 95% of it's in first pass through the blood system, goes to the kidney, the kidney filters it out very efficiently, which for good reason, it's trying to maintain your blood in a certain um, uh, status. So the fourth level of protection here is called the innate immune system. And this is a, a pattern recognition receptors that goes back to uh, worms and to flies. So if they don't have an adaptive immune response of T cells and B cells that make antibodies, for instance, against specific antigens, what they recognize is through these um, TLR genes, which are called toll-like receptors and a variety of other receptors, they're not binding to the RNA in red and um, blue here, it's a double-stranded helix, that what they're binding to is the backbone of it, not the specific sequence, but the backbone, because if there's, to go back to your question, if there's naked nucleic acid, RNA or DNA, you want to have fight a response because that suggests that there's an invading nucleic acid genetic information trying to get inside of your cell. And so these receptors signal for cells to stop everything they're doing. Um, and if they can't get rid of it, they kill those cells because better to kill a cell that's infected with an invading genetic material than allow it to survive. So if that wasn't enough, um, these need targeting domains as well, too, to get to the specific cancer cell and, and for what I'm interested in this in. So we have this, this diametrically opposed um, problem. We have these attributes of drugs that are absolutely amazing. If delivery of these into cells wasn't a problem, you would never take a small molecule except for opium. You wouldn't you would always take this kind of a drug because it hits the gene you're interested in and no other gene. For all the small molecule uh, therapeutics that you've taken, we have really no idea for any of them how many proteins they actually hit. You know they hit the target and related proteins, but there's no way to determine how many others that they actually hit. Whereas with these drugs, we know exactly all the genes they hit and we can eliminate the ones that are called off targets. We can eliminate those by how we design these and the sequences we use for this. So they're absolutely incredible drugs, except for all of this. Um, and in the world of um, NIH speak, these are all boring problems that biotech companies should be investing in. Um, and of course, biotech companies will not invest in solving these problems because they can't make a drug anytime soon and the investors want to make drugs. They don't want to do basic science that the NIH should be doing. And so um, solving these kind of problems turns out to be really private foundations. So the vast majority of money that I've taken in on this project, which is about $7 million, I would say six of that was from private foundations that I've stolen from all over the place. I lie, cheat, and steal. So. What about, what about microsome delivery? I mean, if you yeah, so, so, so we'll, we'll get into that. So, so the, the, one of the solutions here is a nanoparticle. And nanoparticles are, um, they, the, the premier nanoparticle is called a lipid nanoparticle, an LNP. Um, these are the ones that are most advanced in clinical trials. They go to the liver. 
uh, predominantly because the architecture of the liver and the liver's filtering these out. Um, they encapsulate the RNA, they protect the RNA, um, they facilitate delivery across the lipid bilayer into the cytoplasm. Um, because it has the word nano in it, it's very sexy. You can make really nice cartoons and movies and nano robots in your blood and all of this. But there's a fundamental problem with nanotechnology. And that is that when you talk about a 100 nanometer diameter across the particle, that sounds small, like your, your nano iPod. That sounds small. In the world of drugs, 100 nanometers is huge. It's like going across Jupiter. So, and when you add up, because it's a three-dimensional, uh, this is only a, a two-dimensional, when you, the diameter, when you add up the three-dimensional size of nanoparticles, they're 100 million Daltons in size. This is 5,000 times larger than the drug we're trying to deliver. And so the curvature here is actually drawn to scale for this particular sRNA. And so you can see that this is, you know, something like into the next building and so this is, is huge. So it solves problems, but it brings in a whole set of problems as well too. And when you start to decorate the surface with targeting domains, the size and the, the um, diameter gets bigger and bigger. And the biggest problem with all of this is the diffusion coefficient. And this is how um, molecules go through water, just like you trying to swim upstream by yourself or towing a boat behind you. So the boat really slows you down because it's large. So if you think about in the gym with the medicine ball and you throw this thing, oh, and you can chuck it maybe 10 feet, that's a nanoparticle. That's how far it goes. That's its diffusion coefficient. In contrast, a golf ball is the same proportion in size as, as an sRNA to a nanoparticle is. And Tiger in his heyday could whack a golf ball 500 yards. And so that's the difference between 10 feet, 500 yards, that's the diffusion coefficient. And the problem with nanoparticles is it's absolutely inescapable. You cannot escape this huge size and you're swimming for solid tumors. Solid tumors, because they're metabolism, they don't have a lymphatic system, that they secrete water as part of their metabolism, water and CO2. And that water means the molecules, the therapeutic molecules, are swimming constantly upstream. And the bigger you are, as I said, towing a boat, the harder it is to get there. So the nanoparticles have a lot of attributes, but they have this inescapable deficit. So for us, um, to solve these problems, because I'm a biochemist, molecular biologist, I'm not a nanotechnologist, and there's plenty of people that can address the serious problems of nanotechnology that I didn't feel that I would be able to. So we hypothesize that if we focused on these charges, the phosphate charges, because we know how to deliver proteins into cells, and if we just neutralize those charges, that one problem, I felt that all the rest of these problems essentially would fall by the wayside. So I invested somebody else's seven million dollars and eight years of my life into solving this one problem. And so the idea is that these blue and silver groups here are protecting groups and they essentially um, are synthesized where the phosphate now is neutral. It doesn't have a negative charge. So we added a little bit more weight and this is essentially a Trojan horse. So it's a, we would call it a prodrug in, in pharmacology. And then, but this is completely inactive. But it's also not recognized by RNases and, and all these, these defense mechanisms. So once we could deliver this across the lipid bilayer, which of course is the problem to solve, that we would have cytoplasmic enzymes that are only inside of cells that would clip off these blue and silver groups and convert it into a charged sRNA that was then loaded into the RNAi machinery and we would target the specific genes of interest. So I pitch that, oh, so here's the structure of an RNA. Um, don't be too afraid of it. The, diff the reason why it's an RNA is because in this position right here called the two prime, it has an OH, a hydroxyl group, and DNA just has a hydrogen, a deoxy. So the problem here is not the backbone or the bases per se, but it's this phosphate link, the um, negative charge there, is an extra pair of electrons that goes back and forth across the phosphate from that oxygen to that oxygen. So 
every phosphate is really two negative charges from a biochemical, a biologist's point of view. And the idea was we would synthesize these where we have these phosphotriesters, because there's three groups to that phosphate, one, two, and then three, and that neutralizes that phosphate. It essentially sequesters those two extra electrons, and that once this goes inside of cell, these enzymes called thioesterases recognize those three atoms in red there, a sulfur, a carbon, and an oxygen, and that it's called a thioester link, and this enzyme only recognizes that. If there's an oxygen in its position, an ester link, it won't recognize it. And once it clips that, then it causes this two-step conversion into a charged phosphate. So if you don't get rid of these, you won't get an RNAi response. And this is only one strand of an RNA, by the way. They're base paired across the, the purple, blue, and green groups here are the nucleotides, the ACGs and Us. So, it has to end up looking like a charged phosphate because you're using cellular enzymes that have the catalytic activity and your drug is this RNA that has to, sit, has to look enough like an RNA that it gets loaded and sits on this enzyme called Argonaut, AgO2. So um, I went to all my ex-friend <coughs> nucleic acids at the university across the street from my lab and said, look, if you guys synthesize this, I'll do all the conjugation and the biology and all the animal work, and we'll see um, what we can do. And they all laughed me out of their office because this can't be done, and the reason it can't be done is because of all the red on here. So there's too many problems to solve to make the molecule that I wanted to make. And I'm not, a, I wasn't a nucleic acid chemist, so I needed somebody to do this for me. And from the chemist's point of view, chemists publish papers like this. These guys synthesize a molecule, they throw it in a lysate, shoot it through the mass spec, and bam, three months, paper, score. So a chemistry graduate student could have a dozen papers. A biology, once after five years of grad school, a biology um, graduate student might have one or two first author papers of big stories, and then they could be co-authors on a couple of other things. So, Biologists, we're, we're in the long run. We're, we're in the trenches for a long time. Chemists are addicted to publishing papers, and that's why they laugh me out of their office. And it's not that any of these problems are chemically insurmountable. It's the summation of all of them that they have to be what's called orthogonally compatible. Every solution has to be compatible with the next chemistry to solve the next solution. And there was eight significant problems. So I liked the idea, of course, because it was my idea, and um, we didn't have, no one has a nucleic acid synthesizer in their lab anymore. It's all um, in uh, companies, reagent companies that synthesize RNAs and DNAs for you, but they won't do what you want them to do without charging an exorbitant amount of money. So when I was a, a postdoc in the early 90s, ABI made this machine that has four uh, columns on it, so you could synthesize DNA oligos for PCR primers. And so I said, why don't we buy one of these on eBay for literally 50 bucks, someplace up here, it's $49.99, and um, we'll see if we can make a couple of these RNAs, and if we can do that, I could justify it to a private foundation that, look, I need $2 million in chemistry equipment, because I'm not a chemist, and so no one takes me seriously for this. So we synthesized the first, so to, to make an RNA, you, you do it in building blocks called phosphoramidites, uh, but they're essentially building blocks that you put one after the other in a specific direction, three prime to five prime. And so each one of these, you could have a triester on the first one and not on the second and a different triester on the third one, et cetera. So we built a building block with a triester on, already inserted onto it it costs like $5,000 to, to make this one because we had no idea what we were actually doing. And I have a chemist in the lab that's, that's trying to do this. And we bought this machine and we, the whole lab is like 15 of us are standing around this. And we put it on there to aspirate and it's going to inject into one of these columns. So it's going to go on right here and it's going to inject itself into one of these reaction vials. And you're going to see some bubbling, some stuff going on so you know it got there. And we put it on sucked it all up out of the tube, and nothing happened. No bubbling, no solution, no nothing. And we're all just kind of standing there freaking out because 
we just did a $5,000 non-experiment, and that's a lot of money in an academic laboratory to be wasting. Plus, all the, you know, it took like two months to make this thing, so the building block. So we were like, I was like freaking out, and I'm like, oh, we gotta stop it. And so we pulled the plug out of it, took it apart, and the, um, took, found the tube that was running from one of the uh, ports here through the back to a pump and that would have been inserted here. And so we got that tube, which our building block, our amidite was in, and we blew it out with argon and then recrystallized it so we could save it and use it for another day. Um, and the reason why it never got here is back in the 90s, no one really thought about the volume mm -hmm. of the reagents. So the, the inner diameter of the tubes was huge where my RNA synthesizer today, the inner diameter is like nanoliters. It's like teeny tiny, so you don't waste any of these precious materials. But back then, those, that kind of narrow tubing um, didn't even exist. So we threw this out. And the reason the guy gave it to us for 50 bucks was it cost me $500 to dispose of it. So he basically unloaded it on me for all the OSHA requirements to get rid of it. So um, I, we got serious. I was able to get from Howard Hughes and other nonprofits several million dollars. Um, and a chemistry lab is kind of like a yacht. Um, whatever the particular device is, at home you would call it a door and it's called a bulkhead on a boat and it costs five times more than it is, even though it could be the exact same thing. And in chemistry is the exact same way. So incredibly expensive and I hired 15 people and we worked in secret for seven years because after a couple of years, I had so much money on this project that my career is now on the lines. Like, we're gonna, if I don't get this to work, my career is over. No one is gonna give me money again. So um, we solved all these problems. Um, however, the reason the chemists didn't want to do it is it took us six years of chemistry to solve this. And nucleic acid chemistry is not very hard. So no insult if there's a nucleic acid chemist here that I haven't already insulted. But um, <laughs> it, it's pretty straightforward. There's not a lot of, of um, places that you can actually do a modification. And the modifications that you can do are rather limiting compared to um, synthetic organic chemistry where it's just a free-for-all of, of you know, a wide variety of things that you could do. So the problem was, and the reason they didn't want to be involved is the orthogonality again. And that is that we would solve this problem and this one and this one and then we would get to this one and it, the solution, the only solution we could come up for that was incompatible with the previous three solutions that we spent two and a half years working through. So we essentially had to backtrack, solve the previous solutions with a compatible to the fourth and then the fifth, the seventh, and the eighth. And we finally did that. In the process, we synthesized a library of these phosphotriester groups here. Here's the phosphate down here, and they all come off, and they have all different chemistry and atoms that are on there that give them a flavor, essentially looking like a protein. So the idea was to sculpt the surface to make it look like a protein. So and when we started, we thought we would make like two or three of these and a couple control ones. We didn't think we'd be making 100 of them, but hadn't we made the 100, we would have never solved the problem because we just wouldn't have had enough data points to point us in the right direction because you're in the dark in a warehouse and you hit a wheel. You have no idea whether it's a car or a 747. You just can't see it. And so you need data points to figure this out. So um, the long and the short of it is we start with atoms. We make these building blocks called phosphoramidides. We put them on a standard synthesizer. We use um, slightly um, specialized deprotection because some of these things have protecting groups on them, and we get purified RNAs. We can purify them on an HPLC, an instrument to purify proteins. Um, we can fly them on the mass spectrometer to get their exact molecular weight, and we can look at them on gels and show that the more we have, the less negative charge that they have. And they have all these great properties. So um, we spent a lot of time on the linker and on the thioester and on the termini, and that's really where that library of, of 100 came in. So, okay, I spent now about $6 million. I'm about seven years into the project, and we still haven't even done an experiment, a real experiment. Synthesizing is publishable, <laughs> which I didn't want to publish until we had the entire picture. We didn't want to publish pieces, primarily because I want anybody else to catch up through all our, our pain and torture. 
So um, now, let's look at these other four problems that I thought we'd be able to solve. And the first one was the RNases. Well, this does not look like an RNA. Because of the silver and the blue groups on there, these triester groups, the, there's still a few charges there, the orange ones that you can see. Um, but for the most part, the outside of this, if this is the RNA, the outside looks like this now. So RNases can't get a hold of this to digest it. And RNases clip specifically at the phosphates, but it can't get to what phosphates are left because it's sterically blocked with these um, triester silver and blue groups. So, okay. Team, solve two problems with one, yeah. Are there any other enzymes that break it down in the cell? Other than no, it, it's just RNases. Um, and then the, the phosphotriester groups here, that what we're trying to do is the, the ends, the termini. So this is really what's presented to solution. The stuff that's back here kind of doesn't matter for the most part. And so the ends of each of those triesters, we put, I pulled the slide out, but we put different groups on them so that they have a nitrogen or an oxygen or a carbon, so they're hydrophobic or hydrophilic or positively charged, negatively charged, which is exactly what a protein has, um, does. It's this hydrophilic, um, this water-soluble surface. And we were trying to sculpt the surface of this in, in the similar way so that it would be presented to the body because there are no phosphotriesters on any nucleic acid in your body. There's not an enzyme that puts these on and there's not an enzyme that specifically takes them off. You have to cut out the whole chunk of, of RNA that would have a triester if it was alkylated by a, a chemotherapeutic, for instance. The body would cut out that whole chunk. They don't know, there's no enzymes to specifically knock each of those out. And that's kind of from the beginning why we thought the approach had some merit, was it should be stable. Th this was not unexpected whatsoever. And then the idea that we could sculpt the outside of it to essentially a Trojan horse. We're making it look like a horse, and inside is the wolf, to use mixed metaphors. Okay, so um, the next question, rapidly cleared by the kidneys. Not. And the reason why is it's not charged. It's got a little bit of a charge, but it's not this real negative charge that the nucleic acid is. So the nucleic acids, this is a gel where um, the fastest, the the things that are on the bottom are the smallest or the most charged. And if we add protein in here, a, a, a blood protein called albumin, it's about 5% of your blood, that um, it does not bind to the SI, the charged SI RNA, because it's so negatively charged, nothing can bind to it. And that's why the kidney can easily see that it's so negatively charged. Whereas for the phosphotriester, which I didn't point this out earlier, but we call it a ribonucleic neutral, an RNN rather than an RNA, to distinguish the two, that albumin binds to this. There's one, two, three, four different um, albumin molecules that are bound to this. Um, and because this looks like a protein. And so we made it a little hydrophobic, so it would bind to albumin. And that essentially keeps it, if this is albumin, or this is albumin, we bind to the side of it, it keeps it in the blood much longer because the albumin just sort of acts as a truck that just drives it around in circles in your bloodstream, as opposed to if it was the naked siRNA with the charges, as soon as it sees the kidney, it gets secreted. So, all right, one chemistry, getting rid of the charges, three things solved. The innate immune response, those receptors, those receptors see the backbone negative charge and the sugar, the ribose sugar. They do not know what that is. So while an RNA will give a strong innate immune response, this primordial defense, that these RNNs do not because they don't look like nucleic acids. So I thought that was a pretty good investment for the six million. I'm not sure the foundations felt that way, but we still haven't actually solved the problem. We've solved some of the problems, but we need a targeting domain. And to get a tar how do you get a targeting domain on here? Because if you just inject this into the blood, it's gonna go everywhere, but it's not gonna actually get in the cytoplasm of any cells. It's just gonna be there. It's, not gonna, it's too big to passively diffuse across this lipid bilayer. So we need a targeting domain. So we invented another kind of triester. Here's the phosphate. And this guy has an aldehyde on the end of it. And that's chemically reactive mildly chemically reactive. So if we add a targeting domain like an antibody or a, a growth factor or a peptide, 
that we can do this conjugation chemistry really efficiently. So here's the unconjugated, smaller, and then here's the conjugated, bigger, and there's very little left there that's not actually conjugated. So it's about a 90-95% conjugation, which in chemistry is pretty good. You can separate out the little unconjugated um, amount that's there. And so this approach allows us to put a targeting domain there and there and there or there or there or there or there because we make the RNAs one building block at a time so we can have this triester or we can have a conjugatable triester and that way we can put things on this end that are different from things that are on this end. Plus we can do this with different types of chemistry and the important thing is we have to get rid of this triester and this antibody or whatever this ligand is, because it's got to go back to a negatively charged phosphate. So this enzyme that we're pirating, this thioesterase, it's only inside the cells. All it cares about is those three atoms. It doesn't care how big this is. It doesn't care how big this is. It just cares about that and eclipses it. The electrons dance back to the phosphate and we get a charged phosphate at the end of it. So one chemistry, five things. You would think we were there, but no, for $39.95, we have one more. And this is the problem, and it currently is the problem to solve. Um, and we've known this was going to be the final problem, but if we didn't solve all of these problems, there was no reason to solve this problem. And at, in building this, we felt that this would, in fact, uh, these phosphotriester groups would help solve this problem, and that's the endosome. So we don't, even though I've been drawing it, that we're going across the cell membrane here directly, we're not actually doing that. So cells are kind of like your body. They have a process called endocytosis. And the endosome is you'll have a receptor that'll bind to a ligand, and that'll stimulate the formation of a small vesicle. And this gets pinched off, and now it's called an endosome. And inside here will be sugar and proteins and lipids and all sorts of stuff. And this eventually goes to an endosome called the lysosome that will chew it up, or it can go to other parts of the cell and do what's called retrograde transport. So there's all sorts of things that can happen in here, and um, receptors can signal to tell to stimulate the. Um, protein or the cell to divide or to synthesize more insulin, all sorts of processes. And what it does is essentially um, separates the volume inside the endosome from outside. From our point of view, from a drug delivery point of view, it's the same problem. It's still a three and a half billion year old lipid bilayer. But now we're inside here and the pH drops from about seven to about a pH of five. So it's a little bit acidic like acetic acid, um, but we get no escape. And if we don't escape from inside here to in the cytoplasm, it doesn't count. Everything that we've done thus far doesn't count if we don't get it into the cytoplasm. So um, this endosome is a lot like your guts, like your intestines. So the lunch that you ate is inside your body, but it's inside your stomach which is biologically separate from the rest of your real body, from the blood system, for instance. So that's the way to think of an endosome. It's still, just like your food, has to go across a lipid bilayer of the lining of your intestines and your stomach. The same thing here is we have to get across this lipid bilayer. So if you add a drug, this particular drug is called chloroquine. Um, you used to use it back in the, the day of the British Empire. You put in a gin and tonic. The reason the Brits drink gin and tonic is chloroquine is highly soluble in gin, and so you would have a gin and tonic when you were in Malaysia or in Singapore, and you would have one twice a day so that you got your chloroquine dose so you didn't get malaria. So this is an, an, an old school malarial drug. And what it does is it actually causes the malarial parasite to pop effectively before your cells pop. But if you raise that dose, you can get these endosomes to pop, essentially punch holes into them, and that would allow then our RNN drug to get into the cytoplasm, and we can do that. The problem is it's really toxic, so exploding these endosomes is not an effective approach. It's a sledgehammer to go forward because not only does it blow up the endosome that has your particular molecule in it, 
but it blows up every other endosome too that for instance may happen to have a virus in it or a bacterium that's been sitting waiting to get into the cytoplasm where it can actually take advantage of all your machinery. So plus toxins that came in and things like that. So it tells us that the problem is escape from the endosomes, but this, and there's been a whole bunch of derivatives that people have synthesized over the last 20 years, um, including several just the last couple of years, and they all have the same problem. So that the effective dose is right next to the um, toxicity, so that, which is called the therapeutic window, therapeutic index, and they're so close to each other that you could never use this in a patient. It tells us the problem, but it doesn't tell us how we can effectively solve the problem. Viruses, on the other hand, um, have the same issue. Viruses are nanoparticle size, they stimulate endocytosis, the pH drops, and an influenza has a, a um, peptide, a cleavage product called HA2, hemagglutin 2, and this is a hydrophobic that when the pH drops, if this is the surface of the virus, that the, um, this HA2 peptide is like this, and as the pH drops, these arms, three of them, actually come out at angles and insert themselves into the lipid bilayer and then fuse the virus with that bilayer to allow the virus to escape into the cytoplasm. And this is a very low toxic process. It's essentially a localized membrane destabilization. So these lipid bilayers are also called membranes. And it only happens, the reason why it's localized, it only happens here but it doesn't happen here. So it's not nearly as toxic um, as a chloroquine molecule, and this is why viruses have been around for a billion years, is because they can do this without killing the cell in the process. So we, oh, and what this, these, this part of the HA2 peptide is, it's very hydrophobic, um, which I didn't put on there. Um, so uh, this lipid bilayer, is charged on the, it's a sandwich, and it's the same molecule that lipid, that fat that faces itself. So it's charged on the outside, and it's hydrophobic on the inside. So it, it doesn't like water on the inside. And it's worked for three and a half billion years. Without this lipid bilayer, none of us would be sitting here today. There'd be no life on this planet. Every life form on this planet is encapsulated by a lipid bilayer, including this virus. So um, it uses hydrophobic um, peptides to insert. And so we thought, okay, we can mimic that process. If we pinch the HA2 peptide that does this, first of all, it's very immunogenic because your body has seen influenza every year, more or less. Um, and we don't have the structure of the virus particle. We have this soluble molecule, so we don't have the geometry and the energy that we can sort of leverage off of to get these things to insert just right. And it's not a single peptide, it's actually a trimer. So we can't mimic that, but the idea of hydrophobic peptides, so we synthesize these things that we call endosomal escape domains, EEDs, <clears throat> excuse me, and we covalently attach them through phosphotriesters. They're hydrophobic peptides, we screen, synthesize the library because we make peptides as well as RNAs, and we um, synthesize a library, screen through it, and look for what works best. And the most hydrophobic amino acids, tryptophans, and phenylalanines, of course, work the best. So what happens is the targeting domain binds a receptor that stimulates endocytosis. The pH drops from seven to about five, and then these endosomal escapes domains are exposed. They insert into the membrane, and they facilitate escape. And the beauty of RNAi, and then this gets clipped by the thioesterase into an siRNA that I didn't draw here, and induces an RNAi response. And this is a works in progress. We have um, a good collection here, but I wouldn't say we're ready for prime time. So I wouldn't be pitching this to a, um, a set of VCs at this point, but maybe in six months. So um, the important thing here I forgot to mention earlier with an RNAi response is it only takes 1,000 of these molecules to get a maximum RNAi response. 1,000 molecules that escapes into the cytoplasm is enough to give you a maximal response for a non-dividing disease for six months. For cancer, 
about every seven days. So for cancer, we would treat about every five or seven days in all likelihood from all the, the preclinical work that we've done. Is, that's probably in the ballpark. So no problem with macrophages? So the macrophage you're trying to avoid because they'll eat this up, but they don't view this as a foreign particle. So a nanoparticle, the macrophage will chew up right away, which is a primordial uh, immune type of cell that will eat that up through macropenocytosis. So um, in comparison to the thousand molecules that we need to get this maximum response to knock down the gene of interest, the therapeutic target, in comparison to a small molecule drug, you need 100,000 to 500,000 of those molecules in your cell every hour of every day in order to get them to work. So the reason you take an antibiotic two or three times a day is because you've got to keep it inside the cell at the effective dose to, get, to kill the bacteria, in this case, stop it from dividing, or whether it's for heart disease or, or X, Y, or Z. So this is a really large number because these are inhibitors. They have to be at a high concentration to keep driving onto the enzyme. But for us, because we're, we're utilizing a catalytic process, we only need 1,000, so a single dose Right now, in the clinics for liver diseases, a single dose of an RNAi for hypercholesteremia, for eating McDonald's, essentially lasts for six months. So it's moved into a uh, phase three trial, and the, the phase two is so statistically significant. Um, the expectation is that the phase three will be once every nine months, um, although as a biotech, you've got to sell something, so it's better if it's once every six months. But as opposed to taking statins, if anybody's on statins in here right now, you're taking statins once or twice a day. Um, for this kind of a med, it's a single subcutaneous injection that the um, pharmacist at CVS can do. You don't have to go to a clinic to do this. A nurse or a doctor doesn't have to do this. And you're good for six months. Come back in seven months, you're still good. Plus there's off-target, I mean, there's issues with statins, but. Oh, th every small molecule has an incredible number of off-target effects. Um, some you know and some you don't know, they just make you feel bad. And that's also uh, patient's compliance, whether they're willing to take statins. And so for some of these uh, patients that have uh, genetically high hypercholesteremia, this is a really big problem. Um, they just won't stay on it. So uh, that molecule wouldn't uh, induce an immune response? No. So once it gets inside the cell... Well, I mean, but it's floating around. Oh, from the outside. So, so what happens is, in, in the case of the liver targeting, there's three sugars called galnex that are the targeting domain, and your liver binds up galnex molecules like that. It, it binds it as fast as your kidney secretes it out in first pass. So it gets bound up, gets endocytose, and escapes from the endosomes. And once you reach 1,000, you're good for six months. Yeah, and so and it's been engineered to avoid the innate immune response as well, too. Yeah, so you can't make antibodies. It's very difficult to make antibodies against RNAs because there's not a lot to grab onto. Where you can have some DNA antibodies because the sequence is actually more exposed. It's more unique for an antibody to bind onto rather than just the backbone. Is There's so much RNA from cells dying in your blood all the time. It's hard to make an, antibody, an adaptive immune response against a double-stranded RNA as opposed to double-stranded DNA. So the RNA gets chewed up so fast by RNA But this is a lot bigger than uh, just RNA. Um, yeah, so, so this now, depending on, depending on what the targeting domain is, um, so you, you need three things. You need this, this RNAi trigger. Um, we like this approach where we make it look like a protein. You need a targeting domain, and you need an endosomal escape domain. So the targeting domain, if it's a ligand, that's small. If it's a peptide, that's small, like this. this is a, these are peptides. If it's an antibody, that's not small. So now you're, you're much bigger. So this is, this is a, what we call an antibody RNA conjugate, an ARC, which is what we're focused on. And so the antibody is 150,000 Daltons, plus two of these, plus a little bit of that, and you're at about 200, I mean, the antibody is 150, you're at about 200,000 Daltons. So you're 10 times bigger than the drug that you started, but you're still 500 times smaller than a nanoparticle from the diffusion uh, coefficient point of view, from the ability to get in. So these are humanized antibodies that we pilfered from the patent literature that we can make in my laboratory with the, the loops, the CDR loops that bind to the targets. You put them into a humanized scaffold, 
We have um, conjugation handles that are genetically engineered into them, so we only put on two of these. We know the exact locations that we put them on, and so that way the biophysical properties, the pharmacology, the PK of this is constant every time you use it, as opposed to trying to randomly conjugate against amines and nitrogens throughout. So depending on the size of the targeting domain will, of course, change the, the distribution throughout the body. Um, I kind of went to antibodies kicking and screaming because I like smaller things because I wanted the size smaller. Um, but because of the uh, pharmaceutical companies, there's hundreds of antibodies, especially in cancer, to all these different cell types. Um, and if you put a drug on here, a toxin, you can kill the tumor cells, but you also kill normal cells that express that same antigen that the antibody binds to. In contrast with an ARC, with this RNA, it's only going to kill the tumor cell that has the mutant gene expressed in it and we can target multiple genes to do a synthetic lethal at the same time. So in the end, I like this approach. We now, so we make RNAs, we synthesize peptides, we synthesize antibodies, and we do all the biochemistry to purify this of HPLCs and then get it into animal models. Um, the linker turns out to be very critical. The type of endosomal escape domain turns out to be critical. Um, the composition of the surface of the RNN also turns out to be critical, and so we're kind of working through this large matrix of this. So we've got a good handle on it, um, but we by no means are ready for prime time. But I don't think that actually answered your question. Um, yeah, I mean, there's just the uh, SIRNN portion looks like a protein, and it's not a native. Yeah, oh, to make, I'm sorry, yeah, so to make an antibody response against that, yeah. yeah, so we don't know that answer yet. And if you try to do this in mice, you're going to get an answer. And then when you get this, hopefully, into clinical trials, you're going to get a completely different answer because the, the mouse immune adaptive immune response does not mimic does not pick up on the same antigens that the humans do. And so most people that do biologics, you're just rolling the dice when you get into a human, and then you see when you have enough patients and you're sampling the blood, of course, um, to see whether you get an antibody, an adaptive immune response against it that would perhaps neutralize it. Um, even recombinant insulin that is identical to human insulin made in your body, you will get a, a small antibody response to that over time um, and those, some of those can be neutralizing where they kill the activity of the insulins, and other ones won't bind with enough avidity that, to grab it and to pull it completely out of circulation. Um, so we do expect that we're going to see something to this, but um, it's, your immune response is set to look at the adaptive immune response, the tips of these antibodies, the CDRs, are set to look for all sorts of different things that don't actually exist in you. And by seeing if we get an antibody to this, to the, the final RNN that we have with the triesters in specific locations, we can engineer away from that by changing the type of triesters and the locations, and then go back and see if we still get an immune response. You're, I mean, financially, you can't do this you know, ad nauseum. But the same problem actually happened with antibodies. So Hybertech was the first biotech here in San Diego, and it was this great idea that came crashing down several years later because of the immunogenicity. There were mouse antibodies put into humans, which were recognized for different, because of the way they're glycosylated um, and the sequences, were recognized as being foreign. And then antibodies just disappeared from the planet. It was a bad word. And 12 or 15 years in the trenches of working out how to humanize this, because the only thing that really needs to be different is the tips of them here on each side. The rest of it can be a humanized antibody to avoid this. And so we kind of think the playbook of antibodies is essentially what we're going to end up with if we get an immune response to these triesters. But because we have this collection of 100 of these, it's, it'll be easy to engineer away from that unless it starts to recognize it right where the triester is at the linkage, for instance, which I wouldn't expect again because um, you don't make antibodies against double-stranded RNAs in the first place. So it's not like for lupus where you have antibodies against double-stranded DNA where you would say, oh, you've, I've, the antibody has a way to kind of grab onto that and then adapt to some other triester sticking off that. So, but 
the body is an amazing thing. We're meant to fight off things. So you would have to, in your, in your hypothetical scenario where you get the injection and then you get another one, or you treat it every day for seven days, and then wherever you are, you decide what your retreatments are. Yeah. When you do retreatment, let's say it's in six months, just pick a number, um, you would have to resequence it and, and recustomize that for that second treatment. Right? Yes. Okay, so. In all likelihood. <laughs> Sorry. So in the commercialization of this, if I'm a pharmaceutical company, I'm freaked out because you don't have a drug, you have a process. Yeah. So if you're if you're figuring out the process, that's awesome. But we're, we're kind of explain that to me. So yeah. So how do the economics work here? So how, how why do I think you could actually do this in the clinics and be commercially viable? Well, I and know you could do it. I'm just no, but I, I mean to be commercially. To, to be commercially viable and actually have, because this is, when you hear precision medicine, today what we're predominantly talking about is, is identifying the genes that are mutated. Not having drugs that, can, that are precision medicine, it's precision diagnostics is what we're at today. This is precision medicine. So how do you do this and make it economically viable? Um, so the first oncogenes that you're gonna go after are the ones that are most predominantly mutated, MYC, KRAS, um, leukemia translocations, MLLs. Um, and so then you have, let's say, half a dozen that get approved by the FDA. And they last for three years, and then the patients get recurrent disease. The, the disease comes back, but it has a mutation that avoids that. So then the mutations that they get, maybe half the patients or a third of the patients get a specific gene, ALK, that is mutated. So then you develop the next number seven against ALK because it's a third of the number of patients in recurrent disease, so I could still make money off of that. So as you go through all of these, you end up, the manufacturing cost of this comes way down. So antibodies, as an example, were hugely expensive when Hybertech was born here in the 80s. Um, and now I think you can make a gram of GMP purified that you can inject into a person of antibody for about three bucks if you're a pharmaceutical company because the, the whole process has been so optimized and the infrastructure has already been invested in. So that's probably the path that this will happen to. Um, so to change what it really requires to the, the direct answer to your question is after we get 50 or 100 of these approved for a wide variety of diseases, hopefully including cancer, then the FDA, we're hoping at some point, because of those 100, they all have the same toxicity profile, which as long as you don't have this and you don't go above this dose, you don't cause any problems. It's gonna allow us to do shorter, smaller clinical trials for the next target and for the next target. And eventually you're gonna have 100 or 500 of these, I hope, that are sitting in a freezer and some in every major city and that when you go in, you get diagnosed, your blood gets sampled, you shoot through a mass spec in the office, which will be cheap, sequence it by mass spec right there, 10, 15 years from now, 20 years from now, and then the doc says, oh, you have a KRAS and a MYC mutation in your bladder cancer. Um, read a magazine, I put an order in, the guy's gonna run it over here, it's already been made, it's already FDA approved, it's already in the freezer, and we're gonna inject this into you, we're gonna give you a dose every week, um, just go to the clinic and have that done because it's, it's right under your skin. You don't have to come back to see me. And then come back in six months and we'll see how you're doing. So that sounds very fantasy, but in fact, in the laboratory, when we want to do an RNAi response against a gene, KRAS or MEC or any other gene, we don't synthesize these. Um, I do, but a regular laboratory right now would not. You get online and reagent companies have made hundreds and hundreds of siRNAs and you get online, it's already in their freezer and the next day or the day after that it's FedEx to you and you do your experiment. So that model is the same model except for the FDA approval part, um, which is kind of the squishy part, um, that we need to go through. So this, this is not going to happen next year or in five years. And the mutations are not Yeah, so what will happen is 
you'll go after the most prevalent oncogenes, like in lung cancer. It's a third of lung cancers have a, a mutation in KRAS, and it's always in the same location, but 80% of those are three different nucleotides. So I could design a, a drug that had three of these in one vial to all three of those genetic forms. The two that don't hit your specific mutation are inert. And the FDA right now, based on some anti-sense oligo approvals, doesn't care if they're inert uh, because it would have the same off-target, um, the same toxicity background profile. So that way, as a pharmaceutical company, I can make one drug, quote unquote, that hits three targets of the same gene, so I don't have to make and go through clinical trials three different, completely separate phase three clinical trials. But the expectation is that as the F, because these are unlike any drug that um, the FDA has ever seen. Changing the sequence is trivial and it doesn't change the biophysical properties. I could change the battery in here to a different battery company, but you would not know that. It still works, it works the same and it looks the same and it feels the same and it has the same toxicity profile. So that's kind of the way to think of this. And as we educate the FDA with successful clinical trials for um, really prevalent diseases, such as liver diseases right now, they get more and more acquainted with this and we get a bigger and bigger database of the potential tox to look for, but the same biophysical properties of the molecule are the same. As long as we don't change this stuff on the outside and we keep it constant. You're good, yeah. So, and, and you know, chemotherapy today and targeted small molecules work. The majority of it, you get about a year and a half of increased survival, but there are 10 or 20% of those patients that actually go into complete remission. Um, so we're not curing all patients today, and I don't expect that this is gonna cure all patients in one fell swoop, but there will be patients that in fact it will do that for, and as we distinguish between that population and the patients that have recurrent disease, we'll get a better idea of how to improve it to get it the first time around. So, but I think the idea, that's you know, way in the future, the idea for cancer today is that we'd be able to manage the disease by treating it every one, two, three, five years, something along those lines. Um, and because it's not a chemotherapeutic, your hair's not gonna fall out, um, you're not gonna feel nauseous, you're not gonna have skin rashes. Um, it, these are small, teeny tiny doses compared to the doses you take of antibiotics, for instance, the actual numbers of molecules. As I said, we need a thousand molecules in a cell. For an antibiotic or for aspirin, you need 100,000, 250,000. So the doses, the amount of molecules, even though it's a bigger molecule, the amount, the numbers is much lower, the molarity, the, the actual dose, um, the, yeah, the moles of it. So um, the, right now in um, clinical trials, we have phase two, one, twos, and threes to targeting the liver, because if we put these three sugar molecules we can target the liver. There are probably four or five companies that are in phase one, twos, and threes for eight to 10 different diseases today. There's a phase three that just finished in December um, that will be the probably first approved RNAi drug for a liver disease. It's a rare, terrible disease which is where you start with, um, with these kind of approaches because you have a limited number of patients. So for biotechs, it doesn't cost them a lot of money to get an FDA approval, accelerated approval. For the hypercholesteremia, that's just started dosing, I think, in a phase three. That's gonna be 3,000 patients. Um, that's gonna take a couple of years for that to be approved. Um, and if it's a choice between statins every day, even if they, you don't have side effects, an antibody every three weeks, which will, tend to give you a rash, or a subcutaneous injection that, sorry, I've been ignoring you over here and focusing on them, uh, a subcutaneous injection that you take every six months, um, which one of these are you gonna choose? Well, and as we get more information on this, we'll get more and more approvals. So let me just um, finish with, um, I know how to type and draw cartoons, but these guys, um, half of whom have gone on to great and wonderful jobs, um, have uh, really were in the trenches um, for the six or seven years 
as we were developing all this technology and nobody had any publications. I mean, we got a couple of publications out of the lab, but they all hung in there and more importantly, were able to get jobs. And so these are the, the lab right now. Um, I have a dearth of women in the lab where usually I have more women than men and for some reason I have more men than women, uh, dramatically so, um, right now. But um, they do all the work and these are all the people that I've stolen money from including your tax dollars. So um, thank you, and I realize I went way past my 40 minutes. So interesting. Thanks. 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 If, if you want the slides um, to help, um, then just email me, and I can also send you a review that I wrote on this uh, a couple of months ago that is written in a, a much more layman point of view to understand these problems of delivery. But the the big problem is getting it inside the cell because of this billion year barrier that really allowed life to happen on the planet. Um, and it's been incredibly effective at doing that. So, so any more questions? Well, I think maybe what we should do is take one-on-one -on -one questions and we'll go outside because we need to leave because it's almost seven and we only have this oh. for a few minutes. Okay. Oh, I was so looking have, at six. It's the I know, time. it's really seven. Oh, So we <laughs> need to actually go into the, uh, into the courtyard. I was like, oh, I have plenty of time. No, no, that's okay. But I just want to thank you in front of everyone who's left. I, I, I really want to thank you. And, and this was a, a really phenomenal presentation, especially showing all of the issues that you had to overcome and are overcoming. Yeah. So please Thanks. come on outside and... It's always a pleasure to come to San Diego. Mm -hmm. And go get it out there, you're so close. Yeah, we're so good. <laughs>